Hey, hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, you'll notice my background is uh, pretty much where uh, I'd rather be right now. I'm sure, you know, we all would have some place we'd rather be, whether it's in our offices or on vacation. But um, anyway, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, th I think um, Ross already clarified, you know, if there's questions and answers and they don't get answered through the panel, I'm also available by email and I'm happy to happy to get in touch with anybody. Ho hopefully you can see my screen um, as well as the slides right now, which has my email address on it, but feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, the, the lecture today um, that I've prepared is about dental emergencies, which is a very broad topic and, and really can encompass um, anything, but um, I, I chose to focus on a few different areas that, um, that we may um, have time to touch on all of them, um, specifically highlighting um, dental trauma related concerns. And let me just make sure that I'm sharing my screen. Sorry, guys. Let's see. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Sorry for the technical um, delay here. Um, but uh, again, you know, here's my um, lecture overview, which involves um, talking about dental trauma primarily, um, as well as touching on some TMJ related issues we might see as an emergency, as well as some um, brief uh, acute bleeding. If there's time, we can talk a little bit about odontogenic infections, but I have a separate lecture planned for that. So if we uh, continue with the CE series, um, we may be able to get to that as well. Um, a little bit about dental alveolar injuries. Um, they represent about 5% of all facial fractures in pediatric patients. They, um, among adolescents with sports-related trauma, it has an incidence of about 36%. So you know, many of our kids and uh, people we know are um, active in sports typically and uh, it's a very common uh, type of injury. Um, it's about 11 to 30 percent among children in the primary dentition and about 5 to 50 percent among children in the adult dentition. So you note a lot of these injuries are children for, for obvious reasons, um, you know, playing and, and doing active sports and, and things of that nature. So we see it highly in the pediatric population. Additionally, boys are affected about twice as often for reasons you can probably imagine. Um, with a peak incidence between either ages two and four or um, eight and 10 years. Um, dental alveolar injuries in children um, versus adults, um, the trauma to the primary dentition affects mostly the supporting structure. And um, generally, you know, the injuries result in luxation or um, exarticulation um, type of injuries, in other words, tooth avulsion, um, which, whereas trauma to the um, primary dentition only results in about 10% crown or crown or root fractures. Uh, most of the time, the, the teeth um, don't have as much support structures as you can imagine, so the teeth will be um, displaced a little bit easier than the um, primary displaced, um, the, the, excuse me, the permanent dentition. Um, so mostly crown or crown related fractures occur in the, in the permanent dentition. Um, direct trauma is what results from, you know, injuries that, for instance, if maxillary incisors protrude, you know, they're more likely to experience um, direct trauma in those areas, as well as those with insufficient lip closure. Um, it can affect the lips, causing lacerations and uh, or partial dental, dental or alveolar fractures. Um, compare this to indirect trauma, which would be um, resulting from force applied to the chin, uh, forcing the mandibular teeth to hit the maxillary teeth, and that typically will result in crown or crown root fractures, but also can result in condylar or um, symphyseal fractures of the mandible. So um, in, in those patients, you may see that, that come in with, say, a chin abrasion or chin laceration, it's pretty important to check the, um, the condyle areas and palpate the TMJs. They may not always complain about pain there, but if you can, if you can palpate them and they have a lot of pain there, I'd be highly suspicious for a uh, mandible fracture, which you know, if it's in the condylar area in a growing child can result in growth deformities if it's not uh, managed properly or um, could result in ankylosis. And, and I, I do see patients from time to time that I suspect had a previous undiagnosed um, condylar fracture as a child based on a growth asymmetry or condylar anatomy. Um, so that's just a little, a little pearl there. Um, some important aspects to take in history in the dental alveolar trauma patient. Um, you know, these are important for um, documentation as well as establishing proper diagnosis and, and treatment plan. So a lot of times, for, for instance, for insurance billing, they'll need to know all this information, especially from a medical standpoint. So when did the injury occur? You know, the time interval can determine the prognosis. For example, if it's a tooth avulsion, it's gonna have a much better prognosis if it happened more recently. And we'll get into some details of that in a minute. Um, how did the injury occur? So the mechanism can give you insight as to what other injuries are expected. Um, if it's, you know, a huge dental alveolar um, arch fracture, you may be more suspicious for a concomitant cervical spine injury, 
or um, some other type of um, associated injury, whereas a, a simple tooth fracture, you may have less of a degree of suspicion for that. Um, it's also um, important to note whether there's any contamination of the injury site. Is there, is there dirt in the wound? Is that, what, where, what did the patient maybe hit their face on that, that could uh, become a factor? Is this related to a dog bite or a human bite, um, which can be um, significant infection risk? Um, and are there missing teeth located? Um, do we have any suspicion that they may be, you know, it, um, for instance, um, aspirated or located um, in, in the lip? I've actually seen that happen a couple of times um, in the emergency department where a patient has a um, lip laceration um, repaired and the um, primary provider um, did not account for, say, for instance, a piece of the maxillary incisor that was embedded in the lower lip and it was closed inside there. And needless to say, that became a problem. Um, so in some instances, if there's a high degree of suspicion that the, the tooth may have been aspirated or swallowed, you may need to obtain a chest x-ray or abdominal x-ray film or, you know, have the emergency room do that. Um, so establishing what treatment has been rendered thus far is obviously important. Are there any changes in the occlusion? Um, you know, this tells you about, you know, likelihood for fractures and, and other related injuries. And also obtaining a, a pretty short um, medical and dental history, anything that might influence your later treatment plans, for instance, whether they have a bleeding disorder or epilepsy and things like that. Um, also, um, were there any open bites or cross bites that were present before their injury? Um, so that's important if you're replacing teeth or stabilizing them, you know, did they, was their bite already like this um, or is this um, new? Um, and, and what helps a lot with that is if you can get them, especially today, everyone has their smartphone, you know, say, hey, can you show me a picture of what things look like beforehand with you smiling, you know, just ask them that, you know, something from a wedding or when they were smiling goofy and somebody might have a picture of them. And you can generally see the alignment of the teeth. It's, it's kind of hard to get a picture of somebody's bite. Most people don't have those, but um, it can be helpful. This is an example of a forum that I found. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll be able to share these slides with you. And I believe this lecture will be recorded as well. So if anyone wants to have access to this, you can, but this is a good example of a dental alveolar trauma record that you can have in your office for just quick documentation to make sure you, you correctly note the uh, key points and, and have a good established medical record. So the Ellis um, classification system of dental fractures is essentially to allow us to have a universal way of talking about these things and um, you know, sharing treatment plans and so forth. So a class one Ellis fracture would be confined to the enamel, a class two would be enamel or dentin, and then class three involves essentially the pulp, and then class four involves a root fracture, which um, may or may not involve the pulp. I think in most cases it usually would. And we'll go into root fractures here in a little bit, but um, the prognosis varies quite a bit by how extensive it is and, and where it's located. So um, injuries can occur to the hard dental tissues as well as the pulp. So you can have um, crown um, infractions, which involves fractures or cracks without any loss of tooth substance. Um, you can also have a complicated or uncomplicated coronal fracture. Same thing with the root, like we mentioned. Um, concussion, subluxation, um, luxation type injuries, and avulsion type injuries as well, which um, I'll go into here in a second. So when there's injuries to the surrounding bone, um, there can often be um, comminution of the alveolar socket. Um, these are usually crushing injuries and are often associated with intrusive and lateral luxations. Um, and when the alveolar wall is fractured, um, it can be either confined to the facial or lingual, or it can be um, involving both, in which case you'll have a displacement of the, um, of the entire ridge. Um, so, you know, essentially with these fractures, they're um, typically managed as conservatively as possible. And I'll go into some examples of how that works, but um, generally, you know, they're not to be opened or plated when it involves the alveolus. The key is to be as minimal, use the teeth essentially as a splint in order to allow that bone to heal on its own and, and preserve the, uh, the tenuous blood supply there. So um, a couple other key points um, in a physical examination in a dental trauma patient. So you wanna make sure that you're, you have a good evaluation of their physical status. Um, will they tolerate you know, the procedure under locals and things like that? Um, and also what are their vital signs? Um, you know, just basic um, vital signs will give you an idea, um, especially if this person just happened to walk right in uh, to your office right away because they, they might be concerned about a significant tooth injury they have, but um, may not be, you know, with an adrenaline surge, may not be concerned about any other possible injuries, but it's important to establish, you know, do they have any intracranial injuries, cervical spine injuries, chest or abdomen injury, and, or like I said earlier, aspiration of the avulsed tooth. So for a mental status assessment, you just want to ask some specific questions. If you're never sure, you can ask them to tell you where they are and, and, you know, what day is it and who's the president, things of that nature, just to kind of orient them. And then, um, 
with um, radiographs, you know, it's it's everyone has different abilities in their office, but um, typically multiple views may be necessary, specifically if you're looking for a dental fracture, um, which can be hard to see, as we all know, um, in, in, in many cases. Um, and then, you know, typically, I, I think a Panorex is a good screening um, image uh, for these. Um, but, it's, you know, if, if you're looking for a more isolated dental injury, um, there's other options as well. Um, it's critical to rule out the head injuries. And, and I bring this up because um, I've heard particularly of a, a malpractice case where a patient came in through, um, through an, um, a dental provider's office and they had a head injury that wasn't um, detected right away and the patient ended up succumbing from their injuries and became very complicated. I don't know how exactly the case turned out, but you know, it's enough to, to just warrant consideration. So you know, was the patient seen in the emergency department? Do they need to be? Is their behavior appropriate for their baseline? Do they have a loss of consciousness? And generally, if they had a loss of consciousness, I think an ED visit would be appropriate. Um, to make sure there's no concomitant head injury, make sure there's no um, other things to worry about, because usually it's the more severe injuries that will cause a loss of consciousness. And it's important to note too, some head bleeds, such as an epidural hematoma, will have a period of a lucid interval. It's usually pretty short, but um, they could they might present, you know, feeling totally fine, and then have a rapidly expanding hematoma cause them to decompensate later. So that can develop um, progressively, as well as some head bleeds will bleed slow and, and develop progressively. So you know, make sure they have appropriate either follow-up or um, someone with them that can monitor them if you're at all worried. Um, and so do the vital signs fit with the clinical scenario in the patient because a spinal injury will cause um, rapid swings in blood pressure as will an intracranial injury. Um, and so you can kind of note that. And if you're ever in doubt, obviously escalating care is, is the most appropriate way to go. Um, with um, back to a little bit more about dental injuries, um, a dental concussion involves um, essentially um, swelling and inflammation of the PDL. And this, um, the tooth may present with um, tenderness to percussion. Um, it's usually not mobile, um, displaced, and, and you typically wouldn't even see sulcular bleeding. So the key with this is optimizing the healing of the periodontal ligament, maintaining um, you know, pulpal therapy. Generally for primary teeth, nothing is indicated. Um, you know, mature permanent teeth with closed apices may undergo pulpal necrosis depending on the um, degree of the injury. So it's important to keep in mind this um, may require um, endodontic treatment in the future. Um, subluxation injuries generally involve a little bit more um, damage to the PDL. Um, the tooth is um, usually um, mobile um, without significant displacement. Um, there may or may not be sulcular bleeding. And I'll have some pictures to show you some examples here too uh, from my experience. But um, the treatment essentially involves optimizing the healing and neurovascular supply. So for primary teeth, following them for pathology and Usually they'll return to, return to normal in about two weeks, um, whereas permanent teeth may require stabilization and um, relieving occlusal interferences. So a comfortable flexible splint can be used generally for less than two weeks with these injuries. Um, but keep in mind the tooth may undergo necrosis if there's a closed apex, so it's important to follow that closely. Um, the prognosis usually is favorable for these type of injuries. Um, if there's lateral luxation, it involves a complete tear of the PDL and there can be um, associated contusion or fracture of the surrounding alveolar bone. Um, so minimizing the movement during the exam is, is critical um, too, so that it doesn't cause further injury. Um, and the crown is usually paddle or lingual depending on the area and um, could be locked into a new position and usually won't be mobile um, due to the fracture of the surrounding bone or um, the, just the displacement in general. So with primary teeth, if there's no occlusal interference, it's best to just allow these to spontaneously reposition themselves. Um, if there is occlusal um, interference, you can reposition it or um, reduce it slightly, um, and there's an increased risk of necrosis with um, that uh, clinical scenario. And then if it's a severe um, lateral luxation or it's near exfoliation time, then um, extraction is a, is a reasonable therapy there. Uh, for permanent teeth, it's important to reposition as soon as possible in order to stabilize and optimize the PDL as well as the pulpal blood supply. So uh, applying digital pressure um, and little force um, is what's needed to, um, you know, you may need to slightly extrude it um, in order to move it and splint it for at least two to four weeks. In my experience, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, um, but um, generally um, the pulpal necrosis and canal obliteration can occur and uh, the root resorption um, is less likely um, with this type of injury. Um, so here's an example um, clinically, and I apologize for the, the picture on the right side being a little bit out of focus. Um, as you all know, it's difficult taking um, pictures in the mouth, especially in an emergency room setting here. Um, but, uh, you know, this is an example of some um, luxation type injuries, and, and these teeth generally won't be mobile, um, and a picture can generally help to establish the appropriate alignment of the teeth, and, and these can be very satisfying and, and, and a good um, therapy, when, especially when you get to it right away and can, can really help the patient. 
Um, and you know, this is the result um, after stabilization. And so what this picture shows here is that the tooth was first manually replaced um, after, of course, good local anesthesia, but um, it, it does take a little bit of time usually, and it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to properly seat the teeth into the, into the socket if there's, um, there could be a bony interference at the apex or um, there could be blood coagulum that prevents fully seating that tooth. So it oftentimes takes a gentle um, but also forceful um, application um, in, in, in the direct area you're trying to reposition the tooth. And again, without causing further injury. So having two fingers to stabilize the arch and then either replacing the tooth with your hands is, is effective um, as is um, you know, possibly using instrumentation to assist. And this is a, um, a 24 gauge um, stainless steel wire um, that is used as a, as a non-rigid um, semi-flexible splint to, to allow a little bit of mobility um, to optimize the healing there um, with it. Um, in this case ended up um, turning out fairly well. Um, I don't have any long-term follow-up for a lot of these cases, but um, you can see there's associated uh, class one Ellis fracture two of number eight there. Um, so here's more um, severe injury um, in, in a patient that obviously has a failing um, non-restorable dentition anyway, but nonetheless, um, you can stabilize it at least um, temporarily before deciding on a definitive treatment plan. In this case, there's a little bit of the surrounding alveolar bone fractured. So um, the, um, the wire was essentially braided together. So if you take two wires alongside each other and then spin a needle driver, hemostat, or wire driver in opposite directions, um, it'll actually braid that wire together, um, effectively strengthening it and providing more of a um, rigid um, type of uh, fixation, which um, you know, can be used to stabilize the um, injury. Another example here, uh, more severe um, type of um, combined luxation with um, dental alveolar arch fracture. Um, and these injuries, as you can see, never look pretty. Um, and so you, you oftentimes can't expect a great result um, right away. The most important thing is to establish the, the most ideal positioning of the tooth as possible, as close to their baseline, um, as well as um, reasonable approximation of any soft tissue lacerations, um, which in intraorally can generally be done with a chromic gut suture. Um, and it's important to wash these areas out very well to remove the, um, any, any necrotic tissue um, or uh, blood or loose bone in that area as well. Um, but again, you typically will see a lot of associated soft tissue injury with these. Um, with intrusion type injuries, um, there's generally PDL compression and crushing fractures of the alveolar socket. Um, the tooth appears um, shortened and missing. And in primary teeth, um, it's important to note they'll be displaced labially through the labial bone plate. So it's important to develop, um, determine the relationship with the developing follicle. So um, typically in these cases, um, you can allow um, spontaneous re-eruption. Um, the extraction is indicated if it's displaced um, towards the permanent tooth um, bud or it involves it um, significantly. But in a lot of cases, you can allow these to erupt spontaneously, which may take up to two to six months, um, but of course allows um, you know, a, a more um, conservative plan to, to um, take place. And you can see from the image on the, on the right-hand side, the typical anatomy of a, a primary tooth um, relation to the uh, permanent tooth um, bud there. So when uh, permanent teeth are intruded, it usually drives them through the alveolar process and um, can result in um, you know, significant um, complications. So if it's immature, you can reposition it passively, allow it to re-erupt, or if it's mature, you can reposition it um, actively um, with or without traction or um, surgically. Um, and it's important to initiate the endodontics within the first three weeks of the um, trauma for the best um, overall prognosis. So this is just an example of what can happen here um, when the primary tooth is intruded into the developing tooth bud. Um, you can see some enamel hypoplasia on that far image on, on the right side. It can also result in um, disturbances and, and um, passive eruption and so forth. Um, so it's important to follow these cases um, over the long term. Here's an example of a child that had some intrusion injuries. Um, and you can see that eventually they will um, stabilize and, and typically re-erupt. But um, you always have the option to go in surgically at a later time frame. So I tend to be pretty conservative with these and allow them to re-erupt if possible. Um, with um, extrusion type injuries, the tooth will appear elongated, it'll be generally mobile, um, and there's an increased PDL space apically on the radiograph. So with uh, primary teeth for minor extrusions, you can allow it to reposition um, spontaneously. Um, with, um, if there's a severe extrusion, you can extract. Um, for permanent teeth, you generally want to reposition as soon as you can. And I mentioned this before, but a slow and steady apical pressure to gradually displace that um, coagulum that forms at the apex of the tooth socket is important and splint him um, at least for two weeks. And there's a considerable risk for pulp necrosis and canal obliteration. So you gotta follow these cases carefully. Um, so here's an example um, where the tooth appears um, significantly elongated. 
um, and um, afterwards is um, in a much um, better position. Again, um, this is using a um, semi-rigid um, splint fixation um, with composite on the um, dentition there uh, for at least um, two to four weeks. Uh, with associated alveolar fractures, touched on this before, but um, if there's movement of the adjacent teeth, um, it's usually suggestive of an alveolar fracture. So if you wiggle the tooth, it looks like it's tra traumatized and luxated, and then the other teeth move as well. That's generally a high degree of suspicion for alveolar fracture. Um, and then frequently no osseous fixation is necessary. Um, it may be necessary in some cases if there's, um, you know, if there's significant displacement and so forth, in which case an, um, an arch bar could be applied or um, even open and, and plated, but that's very rare. Um, the complications involved necrosis of the tooth, uh, resorption of the root, and loss of the surrounding bone. Um, coverage of antibiotics is generally um, supported in literature in these cases um, to allow for um, decreased risk of infection. These injuries are usually contaminated. Um, here's a pretty um, severe example um, where the um, entire alveolar uh, wall is fractured. Um, there's an avulsed tooth in the area as well. Um, so with um, pulpal testing, and I believe there's a poll question um, that should show up here um, associated with this, but um, it can result in false negative um, testing immediately following the injury. So it's important to uh, retest um, actually several weeks later and determine the need for um, endodontic therapy um, at that point. Um, so I believe pulp que uh, the uh, question should be um, reading is which has the highest injury of um, pulpal necrosis, um, either intrusion or um, extrusion. So um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to, uh, to vote here, um, and then I'll just go right into the answer. So let's see. Okay, so intrusion has the highest incidence of uh, pulpal necrosis with a rate of about 65 to 90%. Um, extrusion um, results in about 64% pulpal necrosis, and this, of course, applies to the um, permanent dentition. So... Uh, let's see here. So um, root fractures involve about 6% of all dental trauma. Uh, most commonly involve the uh, maxillary incisors for reasons we talked about before. They you know, are significantly protruded typically um, compared to the rest of the dentition. Um, clinical exam, you'll see um, slightly um, extruded tooth, usually displaced lingually, difficult to distinguish between a luxation type injury. So the better the prognosis, um, the, the prognosis is essentially a lot better if it's more apical of a fracture. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, um, it can be managed expectantly if the tooth is not mobile and um, there is no degree of um, no degree of displacement. Um, so if the, the fracture is very apical, like an apical one third, sometimes you can just watch this and then monitor for future endodontic therapy. Um, but the tooth can also be um, repositioned and stabilized. If the fracture is near the cervical margin, you may need a longer splint time, um, even up to four months. Um, but um, some cases, you know, you just may need to extract and move on. So. Um, especially if it's a vertical root fracture. Um, this again rarely occurs in the primary dentition. That just has to do with the um, amount of uh, tooth support in comparison to the uh, primary dentition. So crown root fractures in the secondary dentition may or may not involve the pulp. Um, if there's no pulpal involvement, um, you know, essentially removal of that coronal segment. Um, and then if there is pulpal involvement, you'll need to consider endodontic therapy um, either immediately or um, delayed. Um, orthodontic versus uh, surgical extrusion. Um, it may require ostectomy with gingivectomy in the area, um, and it may require um, a two, one to two week delay uh, following um, the coronal bonding um, to, to go back in and treat. Um, so um, obviously vertical um, crown root fractures uh, may require extraction and uh, you can possibly do immediate implant placement in a lot of those cases too. Um, so um, here's an example of a um, coronal fracture. This is obviously a patient that um, doesn't go to his dentist very often, but uh, had an injury um, resulting in a coronal fracture, displacement of uh, number nine as well. So um, actually had bonded, um, he had the tooth fragment with him, and in this case just bonded it back in place just for a temporary fix for the patient before he could get back into to a dentist. And it worked for a surprisingly long amount of time. Um, he was followed for about six months um, before he was able to get back into a dentist um, and uh, have that, that area permanently treated, but it actually surprised me how long that fragment was able to be stabilized. Um, and you also notice the braided wire there um, for a little bit more um, added stability, um, because I believe that uh, tooth was um, significantly mobilized. With um, tooth avulsion, um, this involves about 15% of all traumatic injuries to the dentition, um, most frequently involved in the maxillary centrals, usually between ages seven and 10 when they're erupting. Um, the tooth can be replanted and stabilized and splinted for about two to four weeks. Um, generally, we put them on a week of systemic antibiotics. And this is where you're going to find um, quite a bit of conflicts in the literature and I encourage everyone to do their own um, explorations. Um, and I have um, some sources at the end of my lecture here. But 
Um, you know, the, the treatment recommendations do conflict, especially when the extra oral dry time is over 60 minutes. Um, and, you know, generally um, you can do some root service decontamination either with sodium fluoride, doxycycline, citric acid, there's all kinds of treatments out there. Um, something in order to debride the area as much as possible and also try to maintain all of the vital um, cells, like PDL cells and so forth um, around the tooth um, so it can be replanted with a great success. Um, so um, if there's a close apex as well, you can perform the endodontics extra orally and then replant um, and then um, debride any necrotic um, PDL. You can also have it evaluated for endodontic therapy about seven to 10 days following uh, replantation um, as well. So with, again, with replanting teeth, um, the goal is to maintain the viability of pulp and PDL cells. So the success is inversely related to the length of time outside of the socket. About 90% of these have, um, you know, are replanted less than 30 minutes, exhibit no root resorption. Whereas if it's over two hours, about 95% have root resorption. So that time interval is particularly critical. And that's something a lot of times that's out of our control um, as providers. Sometimes the patients will walk in six hours after with the teeth in a dry jar, in which case you may have to have a conversation about it. it might not be in their best interest to replant the teeth at that point. Um, whereas if they, they come in right from the soccer game and they're there within an hour and the teeth went right into a um, saline or, or even milk and, and so forth, um, those things will work well. Um, and they, they've done some studies and you've probably heard of Hank's Balanced Salt Solution, which is a great medium to have to, to stabilize and, and preserve the uh, PDL cells. Although obviously most of us don't have these with us um, you know, when it's convenient. Um, but for instance, if you're um, a soccer coach or you're, um, and, and, and you're at a game or even just a parent that, and you're a dentist there, you know, maybe having some of this around just in case there's that type of injury may eventually save someone's tooth and that, that'd be a great thing. But um, even placing the tooth back inside the mouth and in the, in the buccal vestibule will, will be better than nothing. Essentially, you don't want the tooth to desiccate and the cells to die. So um, lots of different options there. Um, there's some controversy about whether you want to curette the area. So um, generally, you want to try to not manipulate any soft tissue with instrumentation. Um, and, you know, the site should be gently irrigated to remove any debris or the blood clot inside of it. But if there's obvious collapse, you can use a blunt instrument to insert in the socket and, and, and reposition any uh, fractured pieces of bone that may be in the area. So post-operative instructions for avulsion, um, the traumatized teeth should, not, should be uh, removed from the occlusion. Um, put them on a soft diet for about two to three weeks, and then splinting um, longer than seven to 10 days may promote root resorption. Again, this is a little bit controversial because a lot of times these injuries will have associated alveolar bone fractures, so you may need to splint them longer. Um, but um, there's always a high risk for um, root resorption, ankylosis, and those type of things. Um, it's important to consider tetanus prophylaxis or booster injection if it's, um, you know, and whether it should be administered, and that can be coordinated through their primary care physician. Um, and then antibiotic coverage with penicillin or clindamycin um, to minimize any bacterial um, activity in the periodontal tissues and, and pulp is important. Um, and I usually would put them on a chlorhexidine rinse for about seven to 10 days. So um, again, just to review, true to teeth, open or closed apex, allow for spontaneous eruption. If there's a closed, um, if there's an open apex um, and there's intrusion up to seven millimeters, or if there's a closed apex with intrusions up to three millimeters, you can allow them to spontaneously re-erupt. Um, other options include orthodontic repositioning as well as surgical repositioning um, in combination with orthodontics or not. So um, evaluating the teeth for um, endodontic therapy at three to four weeks is, is pretty critical um, as well. So um, just other examples here, um, tooth avulsion, um, lateral luxation um, with adequate um, repositioning um, of this as well. So this shows, um, this is an interesting case that this, this child uh, was riding his bike and um, imme immediately came uh, for treatment about within 20 minutes of his um, injury, which is quite amazing. And he had the teeth um, with him. So they were immediately placed in a saline solution. The area was um, irrigated thoroughly and, and the teeth were replanted and most of them ended up doing pretty well. Um, obviously had some fractures associated with them, but um, it was encouraging to actually see somebody within an hour of the injury. I thought it was actually very rare. So um, he ended up having a nice result. I'm sorry, I don't have any long-term follow-up pictures here, um, but um, it does. Um, he did have a nice uh, result with that. And here's a more complicated injury, just to show you some of the things that that can happen and important to consider. Um, so, what you see in the picture on the right is um, the result of a softball um, injury to the face. Um, so, in a 14-year-old um, otherwise healthy female. And um, you see, there's multiple missing teeth, um, some displacement of those mandibular teeth as well. And um, the two pictures on the left side show what she looked like before her injuries. So these were you know, pretty helpful in um, determining you know, the alignment of the teeth and also um, trying to give our best guess as to what her bite looks like. And you can see there's 
you know, pretty good overlap of her uh, maxillary incisors and, and her um, mandibular teeth there as well. So um, it's important to kind of use that, use all the tools you have available in these cases to try to help um, in terms of uh, treatment. So um, this shows um, what appears to be, um, you know, adequate treatment. So replacement of the teeth, semi-rigid splint fixation, pretty good um, aesthetic result. And again, these things never look pretty um, immediately following um, significant injury. Um, allow that to stabilize, it'll look fine. But if you actually check the bite here, um, you'll notice that um, this is not correct. So um, it's important sometimes to consider, especially if a patient has a deep bite, you know, that splint may need to be placed lingually. Um, you may need to get some assistance um, with your orthodontic colleagues. Um, a lot, lots of good um, ways to treat this, but certainly getting the teeth replanted immediately um, is ideal. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have any final pictures of this either um, handy, but um, this does show, um, you know, a, a, a semi-rigid splint applied to the maxillary arch and then a more rigid splint applied to the um, mandibular arch to stabilize the adjacent bone as well. So they didn't involve any bone fixation here. And then the soft tissue injuries generally take care of themselves um, with or without a couple um, sutures there. So um, again, with tooth avulsion and primary teeth, don't replant them. Um, and then there's a risk of pulp necrosis um, as well. Um, the uh, possible um, interference with the development of the succedaneous teeth, which we talked about. Um, associated um, soft tissue injuries can occur. So with um, blunt trauma, there can be um, hematoma and edema in the deeper tissues. Um, this sometimes can cause um, limitation in mouth opening and, and things of that nature. Um, and then it can also cause um, swelling and bleeding in the floor of mouth. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. Um, abrasion type injuries involve um, shear forces removing the superficial layer of tissue. Um, lacerations could be simple, um, they could be stellate or flap-like, um, and then um, it's important to wash those out um, very thoroughly before um, applying any sutures to, to fixate um, and, and um, fix those. With avulsion, it can be missing tissue, um, which is um, always complicated. Um, generally in the mouth, we have a little bit of leeway to, to help with that, but um, certainly if you're, you're missing skin, um, that can be um, a big issue um, aesthetically. Um, puncture and penetration injuries require their own considerations, as well as gunshots and blast injuries. Um, these can have um, a delayed um, presentation of necrosis. Uh, puncture and penetrating injuries need to be um, considered for deeper um, vascular involvement, um, as well as any uh, potential foreign bodies that may need to be removed. And uh, with thermal and burn injuries, um, they oftentimes um, can um, result in delayed necrosis and high rates of infection and things of that sort. So it's important to keep those in mind. And, Bees and sting, um, excuse me, bites and stings can uh, cause other types of injuries too. So the management of soft tissue injuries already touched on, tetanus prophylaxis being important, um, and then um, inspecting the site for foreign bodies, handling the tissues as gently as possible. Um, I can't emphasize the irrigation component enough. Um, that is really key to um, minimizing contamination, um, especially if it's a bite injury or there's contaminated dirt there. So um, for a typical um, laceration inside the mouth, the oral cavity, um, I, would, I would irrigate with about 500 cc's of, of a sterile saline under pressure, um, trying to generate a minimum of about 7 psi, which disrupts the bacterial activity at the site. So, so all that, that irrigation, even though it seems like a lot for a small wound, can be really critical to decrease the um, risk of infection after. So you always want tension-free closure and um, you know, hemostasis as well at the injury. And these are just some examples, uh, what I would call some degloving injuries of the uh, mucosa there, uh, which can be a little bit tricky. Um, sometimes they come together nice um, if there's no missing tissue, and then sometimes they, um, you know, require a little bit of uh, mobilization of the adjacent tissues there. So um, here's some examples of um, associated um, soft tissue injuries you may see with dental alveolar trauma. It's important to note if there's a lip laceration, does it cross the vermilion border? Because that becomes a, a very um, aesthetic thing. Um, they, they think that Based on studies, people can tell a difference in, in even just about a millimeter or less of um, discrepancy of the vermilion border. So um, alignment of that, um, that structure is critical. Um, and then the mucosal injuries of the lip um, you know, may require um, more, um, a longer lasting suture um, or, or even deeper layer closure in order to prevent opening later on because we know the lips move quite a bit. Um, when we speak, so here's an example of that, um, and this is a, a what I would call an unfavorable lower lip laceration in that it um, kind of opposes the, the muscle pull of the um, muscles in that area there. So what can happen is that wound will want to hiss um, unless it's closed um, very tightly or with, especially with the longer lasting sutures, so that just shows a vicral there. And of course, there's massive lower lip edema, so that makes it um, very problematic as well for closure. So in some cases, you have to actually expect that the edema will will increase um, before, um, you know, after a few days rather, so.
And it's important to keep in mind there, there could be signs of a mandible or maxilla fracture. Um, I see a lot of these, um, and you know, I would say that a majority of them present with some type of malocclusion. Um, you usually see a unilateral open bite um, that is um, it, it, on one side. So for instance, on the opposite side of a, um, of a condylar fracture, you may have an anterior open bite, especially if there is um, bilateral condylar or subcondylar fractures. Um, and if I ever see a patient following a uh, traumatic injury and they have floor of mouth ecchymosis um, or like, you know, kind of a bruising all along the underneath the tongue there um, and there's um, hematoma or anything like that, it's a mandible fracture until proven otherwise. So I'll look really, really hard for that. Um, and then same thing with a um, with palatal ecchymosis. Um, that's can that's generally associated with a Lafort type of maxillary fracture. So it's important to kind of rule those out. Um, and um, if you present with trismus, um, that, that could represent fracture, especially of the condylar or subcondylar areas of the mandible. But um, trismus will also occur um, sometimes just due to associated muscle injuries and hematoma. And um, even the, the joint space in the TMJ can have a have a hematoma that will result in an open bite and deviation on opening and things like that. So um, generally, these fractures will deviate towards the side that they open. Um, here's another example. This is a photograph on the left side of a patient that actually you know, she had this. Um, she took this herself um, to show what it looked like immediately during the injury. And then this is how she presented um, in the office on the on the right hand side. And there's a, a fracture. I'll show you the um, X-rays in a minute here, but. This is a girl that was healthy 17 year old just playing in the yard and got hit with a tire swing. So um, kind of an unlikely um, injury result in a fracture, but um, it can certainly happen. And, and she's lucky in her case, you know, if you appreciate on the panoramic radiograph here, uh, there is a um, non-displaced fracture involving the right parasympathesis area. And it's important to note that, you know, this fracture is um, through the um, socket of the um, canine number 27 there. And um, that would be considered an open fracture, meaning um, there's contamination of the otherwise um, the, of the basal mandible bone there um, that can have a high risk of infection. So generally when we have these open type fractures are treated with antibiotics. On the cone beam uh, 3D reconstruction there, you can appreciate that this is um, a non-displaced fracture. And typically fractures of this area of the mandible would require opening and fixation. Um, but um, in her case, we're able to treat this closed. So this is just an example of um, one type of treatment can offer these patients with, um, these are called um, IV loops and circumdental wires. And um, these, um, this is uh, done in the office um, under IV sedation. The, a bridal wire was placed between the teeth to stabilize the fractured segment, can prevent it from being mobile. And then the patient was placed into intermaxillary fixation for a period of about four weeks and she um, healed great. You can see the post-operative uh, panorex there about six months later, um, she ended up doing very well. Um, here's an example, uh, kind of a rare injury I had earlier this year. Um, this is a two-year-old child that was um, just watching a gymnastics match, um, got kicked in the face by being a little too close, and um, she had a displaced parasympsis fracture. And in kids, of course, as always, we try never to have to do any in involved surgery. And you know, there's some advantage in kids in that they heal very fast, but um, in her case, we actually had to go in and put a plate on there because it was such a significantly displaced fracture. And again, there's no support structure of the primary teeth, so doing wire fixation in her case um, wasn't possible. So this, this fracture required um, opening and we actually were able to use a uh, resorbable um, plate um, in this instance. So that plate will actually dissolve in about, um, about six months to a year. And then you can see that, you know, we were able to do this intra orally as well, which is a huge advantage. Um, we had to skeletonize the mental nerve, but um, another example of um, a fracture here. And I think there's another poll question that should pop up and I'm going to wrap up here in a couple minutes. Um, but what you can appreciate is that there is a um, right unilateral um, condylar fracture and also a subcondylar fracture. It's kind of rare to have two fractures on the same um, side of um, the mandible, but it can happen. Uh, the, the lower jaw is like a pretzel, um, we like to say, and most times it's, it's, it's more often than not that you get a fracture in two places rather than one. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. So the poll question is displaced condylar fractures um, may require open or, or do require open reduction with internal fixation. Is that true or false? Give that a second here. There might be a little bit of delay. And I'll say that the answer is um, the answer is um, essentially false. Um, you don't have to open all of these, and, and I point this out just because a lot of us may see these patients in our practice um, in the future with um, a uh, displaced um, condylar fracture, but it's it could be old, so it may look odd. But if the patient has good function, they can open wide, and um, they can. Um, you know, they, they can function, then it's fine. Here's an example of that previous patient. So in this x-ray, you can see a dis significantly displaced condylar fracture and the non-condylar fracture. There's a um, premature occlusion on that same side, open bite on the opposite side. Here's her place in the, um, 
intermaxillary fixation. Um, and this is a, a post-operative film about six weeks later. And you can see the condyle heals in a spot that is obviously not normal, but um, she can actually open. And with physical therapy, this patient ended up going back to normal opening with almost an insignificant deviation to one side. So we consider this treatment a success. You know, these fractures, sometimes you can't open. There's not enough bone to plate or um, by opening them, you risk um, significant injury to the facial nerve. So um, just here's another example, just to show sometimes we have to open and plate these. Um, and um, these are some references for um, dental alveolar trauma, which I'll, I'll have for you guys. And, and real quick before I wrap up, um, I have less than a minute here, but I'm just gonna touch on open lock scenarios. You may encounter this and it's, it's pretty, pretty rare um, to be honest, but when it happens, um, it can even happen in your dental office from a procedure and the patient has their mouth open wide. Some people are, are prone to this and, and you can see from the clinical photograph, this male is opening up way wider than would be um, normally um, physiologically possible. He, he's presenting with a bilateral um, open lock type scenario, which is kind of rare. A lot of people will um, just dislocate only on one side and they'll be um, usually in a lot of pain when this occurs. And it's important to try to treat as early as possible. The earlier you treat it before muscle spasm, the better. So we typically treat these by uh, placing downward pressure on the molar area and um, imagining that picture that's on the far right where the um, condyle is actually displaced anterior to the articular eminence. So if you try to just close the jaw, it's not going to go back. It's just going to rotate and stay in front of that articular eminence. Whereas if you are allowed to go down and then push back, um, it'll allow it to go around there. So the key is that downward uh, pressure with your thumbs on the molars. And a lot of times it, it's, it's painful for the patient. So good local anesthesia. Um, in that area as best you can. Um, sometimes they require sedation, but if you get to it early enough and you apply slow and steady pressure um, in a firm way and you're confident with the direction, it usually works very well. So um, other causes of um, hypermobility, um, you can have post-trauma issues, connective tissue disorders, um, and um, a lot of times you can get, you can get injuries um, that require, um, that can be prevented by um, placement of a bite block. I always use a bite block for extractions on the contralateral side, so highly recommend that. Um, and then um, there can be an anterior disc displacement um, without reduction or a closed lock type of scenario. So the patient may have had clicking and popping before in their jaw, and now they can't um, open their mouth and there's no noise. Um, and that's typically, you know, you can almost diagnose it sometimes from the history. Um, but an MRI will show a displaced disc um, without reduction on opening and a closed lock scenario. And this is getting into a more complicated thing, but just wanted to touch on it. So conservative management um, would be the initial treatment followed by um, secondary treatment that may involve um, you know, an arthroscopy or arthrocentesis or interarticular injections, but essentially the disc can be out of position. And I would consider this to be a dental emergency when the patient can't open wide and they can't function. Um, and a lot of times we'll put them on a steroid or muscle relaxant and SEDs and things like that. And I'm happy to answer more questions in detail about this if anyone wants to know. Um, and a lot of times it can involve the muscles. So here's a, a skull that we use in our practice to show patients that all, all the muscles that are involved too, because a lot of patients come in with quote unquote TMJ and it's you know, a lot of times a muscle issue. Um, sometimes it's true joint, but um, it's, it's helpful to kind of um, aid with that. So just a quick um, pearl on um, acute bleeding. So, um, you know, essentially, you know, preventing this is, is, is so important, you know, planning your extractions if they're, if they're on an anticoagulant, you know, minimizing it if you're not going to take them off, it's just one area. Um, obviously, judicious application of pressure, you know, there's not any huge blood vessels in this area typically, so it's more of a nuisance type bleed. And I would say, you know, as an oral surgeon who takes plenty of call, you know, when I get calls about bleeding, I, you know, a lot of times it ends up being a situation like you see in the picture on the right where the gauze just isn't wedged in between the site properly and the patient's not applying it firmly. So that's critical. Um, use of epinephrine judiciously um, can be very effective as well. All types of packing, sutures, cautery, different rinses, um, all the way up to topical thrombin. And then if none of that works, essentially at some point you may have to consider medical management. Um, and that, I have some references for this as well. Um, I ran a little bit over, so I apologize, guys. We'll have a little bit of a break here. Um, and then um, Dr. Uh, Bill Diamond will get started with um, his lecture um, probably just after um, 10 a.m. Or, or 10 a.m. on the dot. So allow Dr. Wadowski to take over. Thanks, Brian. Great job. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, we've got a couple questions here. Can you hear me, Brian? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, sure okay. can. Yep. So first question here is, uh, is there any particular brand, uh, brand of splinting material that you like to use uh, or can we use composite or nitai wire? Um, I, I typically, you know, we're, as oral, oral max facial surgeon, we have a lot of uh, stainless steel wire in the office and we use these a lot for, um, for fractures and so forth. So I, I just prefer myself as, ha and it's readily available in hospital emergency departments too. So we typically just use a, a 24 or 26 gauge um, stainless steel wire. 
but I, and I suppose a nine tie wire and, and maybe any of the orthodontists here might have more information about the, you know, they might know more about the best type of fixation there. But for me, I just prefer Perfect. the stainless steel wires. Next question. Uh, what is the percentage slash chances of resorption, uh, either external or internal in the future for uh, teeth that are severely traumatized? Yeah, I mean, that, that's going to depend a lot on just the, the type of type of injury. Is it a concussion? Is there lateral luxation and so forth? I, I touched on some of the percentages in the slide there, but, um, you know, I have a high degree of that suspicion for all these cases. So I think that the key is just following up in about three to four weeks and then having them having them evaluated. And I, I'll usually, since I'm not the expert in that, I'll, I'll send them to my, you know, restorative colleague or endodontist and so forth for um, working up on, on those those particular injuries. But as far as exact percentage, I do have some of my slides before, which I'll be able to share with you guys too. So, Perfect. Yeah, that actually cues up the next question, which was, can we have this presentation slides later for review? We are actually uh, recording this, so uh, there will be access to it later on. We may rebroadcast it as well in the future. And then also, if you if you all want slides, we can provide those to you as well. Uh, one other question, uh, how would you do local for displacement, local infiltration through the skin, I am assuming, is, uh, is the question. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll do local in, the, in a similar way as, as you would do for a, an extraction. Um, certainly, you know, targeted blocks can be very effective. Um, you know, if you're working posteriorly, posterior supialveolar block, if you, you know, it's in the premolar area, canine area, the maxilla, you can do an infraorbital nerve block, which can be done generally intraorally, um, you know, and it, Patients tend to tolerate that better. You know, certainly you can you can do an extra oral um, infraorbital um, block, but I just find that you know unless there's a severe infection and, and you know it's kind of traumatized to the patient, so I'll, I'll try to avoid to go an extra orally if possible. But um, a good local again, it's critical. Like like any procedure we do, it, it really does give us the uh, freedom to treat these cases properly and uh, making sure that you know there's limits of bleeding of the area as well. So. Um, I generally don't worry too much about blood supply because you, you could think about how the local and the epinephrine might, you know, decrease blood supply and compromise it. But it's usually just a transient thing. And, and there's so much um, good blood supply already to the dentition in the, in the surrounding area compared to, say, for instance, the finger or other areas in the rest of the body. So, Perfect. Uh, and last question, uh, what would you prescribe postoperatively for a locked open situation? Um, so if a patient um, comes in locked open, um, I, you know, generally I would send them out with a, um, you know, more important is that is this the physical management of it. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's, um, you know, definitely ibuprofen like an NSAID to reduce the um, inflammation if they can take that. Um, but I also would, would probably send them out. We have these jaw bar, bra wraps and I don't know if you can see me, but it kind of wraps around the, the head and the neck area to kind of prevent. The key is just preventing it from happening again. If it happened once pretty easily, they usually can, can do it themselves and these patients can you can train them actually so that when they yawn and open, they can put their fists underneath of their chin and that'll help um, prevent um, significant mobility issues. Um, but um, generally just, just pain medicine is, is indicated there and then close follow-up and, and, you know, prevention of it happening in the future. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate this uh, excellent lecture. And uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute break here and queue up our next speaker, Dr. Bill Diamond. So if y'all need to stretch your legs or uh, do whatever you need to do, uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes.